Hello, I am Peter Okwacha. Welcome to Focus on Africa. Our top stories. Taking on the major killer, scientists in South Africa say they have discovered a new cure for the deadliest strain of tuberculosis. Is someone listening? Allegations technicians for tech giants Huawei are spying on some high-level officials in Africa. The camel milk and meat, how herders in Niger are cashing in on this humped animal. Also on the program, Fashion Forward. We meet a South African designer whose collaboration with clothing brand H&M is bringing Africa to the world. This moment is, is historic uh, because I'm sure a lot of young women are looking at me now and thinking, okay, okay, I'm on the right track. And in sports, it's quarterfinals day in the women's Afro basket competition taking place in Senegal. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Scientists in South Africa and the USA say they have discovered a new cure for the deadliest strain of tuberculosis. Being infected with the so-called XDR strain was seen as a death sentence as it is resistant to all forms of antibiotics typically used to fight the disease. Tuberculosis is caused by bacteria that usually affects the lungs. It is curable and preventable but it's also easily spread. When people with lung TB cough, sneeze or spit, they propel the TB uh, germs into the air. A person needs to inhale only a few of these germs to become infected. 25% of all TB deaths happen in Africa, the second highest recorded area on the planet. TB is the world's deadliest infectious disease. More than a million people around the world died from it every year. Now, Dr. Van Everett is, uh, was part of the research team behind this breakthrough. He's the senior medical officer at the nonprofit group TB Alliance. This is a huge development. Is this new cure readily available yet, doctor? Well, thank you. Uh, yes, this cure, which is a combination of three drugs to treat patients with the most resistant type of TB, has just been approved by, by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So next, it will need to have guidelines written by the World Health Organization, and then other countries around the world will need to approve it uh, to get it into wider spread use. Uh, should we be cautious about this drug, though, given the fact that the bacteria that carries the TB virus is quite versatile and known to develop a resistance against antibiotics? Well, at the moment, there's very little resistance any place to either of the th any of the three drugs that are used in the regimen. But over time, the drugs have to be used very carefully. We have to be sure patients take the full course of treatment to try to avoid uh, resistance developing. And we, with scientists around the world, will be watching carefully to watch for any resistance development. And there's an assumption that uh, TB has been dealt with already uh, around the world, but that would be wrong now. Uh, is it now the world's deadliest infectious disease? Yes, about two years ago, TB overtook HIV as killing more people in the world than any other single infectious disease. So it's a huge problem, even though in many places people don't think it uh, or think it was uh, cured years ago. And we do know that it's a major killer on the African continent. I mean, you've just taken us through the steps that it has to go through before it can be rolled out. But what time frame are we looking at uh, realistically? Well, we're in the process of submitting the, all of the data to various countries uh, in Africa and around the world uh, with our partners. Um, while those regulatory authorities are evaluating and formally approving it, though, ministries of health in different countries can work with us to get the drug and the regimen to people um, through various access programs. So we're working on a country by country basis to try to hopefully get the ability to use the drug uh, faster um, while this is ongoing. Dr. Dan Everett, Senior Medical Officer at the nonprofit group TB Alliance, thank you very much for your insight into this story. Thank you.
Let's take a quick look now at other stories making the headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. A former Sudanese spy chief and his family have been banned from entering the United States because of his alleged involvement in human rights violations. The U.S. State Department said it had credible evidence that Salah Ghosh was involved in torture when he was in charge of Sudan's National Intelligence and Security Services. Mr. Ghosh served under President Omar al-Bashir, who was ousted from power in April. Burundi has started vaccinating its healthcare workers against Ebola in an attempt to stop the spread of the disease from neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. The country has not recorded any cases of Ebola so far, but its order, uh, border with the DRC is considered highly porous. A year-long Ebola epidemic in the DRC has killed at least 1,800 people. And dissidents within Mozambique's former rebel movement, Renamo, say they are now planning to go ahead with a national conference on Saturday to oust their leader, Usufo Momade. The dissidents claim loyalty to former leader Alfonso de la Cama, who died in May 2018. The leadership has described them as undisciplined deserters. Huawei technicians allegedly helped intelligence officials in Uganda and at least one other African country to spy on their political opponents. That's according to an investigation published by the Wall Street Journal. The newspaper report claims that some employees of the tech giant helped to crack encrypted communication of popular musician turned polit politician Bobby Wine. There's no evidence in the report that Huawei executives in China were aware of what was happening in Africa, Huawei responded with the following statement. After a thorough and detailed internal investigation following the WSJ report, Huawei rejects completely these unfounded and inaccurate allegations against our business operations in Algeria, Uganda, and Zambia. Our internal investigation shows clearly that Huawei and its employees have not been engaged in any of the alleged activities. Well, let's speak to Ofuono Opondo now. He's a spokesperson for Uganda's government and joins me from Kampala. Mr. Pondo, is the government spying on opposition politicians? Peter, that is false. And in any case, we don't need Huawei to help us to do so. In Uganda, we run a transparent democratic system. The opposition politicians speak their mind openly on the media at public meetings. And therefore, there is no need to use underhand method to find out what they are saying or what they are doing. It's interesting that you say that, Mr. Pondo. That it's quite interesting that you say that because it's not the first time that your government has been accused. In 2015, a top secret document was prepared by a senior intelligence official for President Museveni, which described a surveillance program codenamed Fungwa Macho, which involved more than 70 intelligence analysts. So you are known to spy on opposition politicians. Well, there will be always bad apples in a system and that is senior intelligence official you are quoting, I don't know who he is, but we have asked him to verify, to, to bring credible evidence that indeed what he alleged at that time did take place. But let's just go back to the Huawei story now. The embassy of China today released a statement and we challenge Wall Street Journal to come and look at the passenger manifest at Entebbe Airport to tell us which... When did the embassy official travel between Uganda and China? And which officials, Uganda officials, security officials, or intelligence officials, went with him to which destination? We are ready to open the passenger manifest for the Wall Street Journal to examine, to prove that they are simply on fabrication and lies. Well, in the past as well, opposition politician Kiza Besije has uh, alluded to the fact that he believes that he, he is being spied on by the government electronically. Well, we all believe that Jesus exists. That does not mean that he indeed exists. So Mr. Besije can make any claim. It, the onus is on him to prove that he is being spied on.
So, but in Mr. Case, Pondo, so Mr. Mr. Pondo, Pondo why do you think day, then that these allegations no are to being... Spy on him. If you say the allegations are false, why do you think that in 2015, the BBC and now in 2019, the Wall Street Journal have brought out these allegations that you are indeed spying against the opposition? Well, the onus is on the BBC and the Wall Street Journal, which made the allegations to bring the proof, credible proof, that what they are writing about, what they are saying, is indeed taking place. And I want to simply repeat, we don't need Huawei or any other technology or any other company outside Uganda to help us know what vocal opposition politicians are saying or about to do in Uganda. We don't need to do that. Mr. Ofuono Opondo, I'm sure we'll still be talking more about this story. Thank you very much for your time here on Focus on Africa. Thank you very much. Welcome, sir. Now, a ceremony has been held in France to mark the 75th anniversary of the Allied landings in the south of the country during the Second World War, with special tributes paid to the crucial role African forces paid in, uh, in the Allied liberation of France. President uh, Emmanuel Macron of France was joined in Provence by Guinean President Alpha Conde and his Ivorian counterpart Alassane Ouattara in honor uh, of the soldiers who joined the fight from France's colonies in Africa. Monsieur Macron called on mayors uh, in the region to remember the African soldiers by naming streets and erecting monuments in their honor, while Mr. Conde called for lessons to be learned from the past. I would like to recall the memory of our elders who, beyond their differences of origin, of race, of religion and culture, have found in them the resources to lead the fight for freedom together. From history and memory, we must not only learn from the lessons of the past, the lessons are only useful for the future. Our people share the human destiny and the duty of humanity. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Peter Okwache. Still to come, Mimi with the sports in football. Will Ivory Coast International Nicolas Pepe start for Arsenal in their Premier League fixture this weekend? I'm Peter Okwache. The top stories this are. Scientists in South Africa and the USA say they have discovered a new cure for the deadliest strain of tuberculosis. Being infected with the so-called XDR strain was seen as a death sentence as it is resistant to all forms of antibiotics typically, typically used to fight the disease. And Huawei technicians have allegedly helped intelligence officials in Uganda and at least one other African country to spy on their political opponents. That's according to an investigation published by the Wall Street Journal. Now, around 80% of Niger's population relies on the agricultural sector for its livelihood, with livestock playing a key role in the economy. Camels are a main source of income, and a lot of entrepreneurs are cashing in on the animals. The BBC's Maggie Mutesi was in Niamey. I met one farmer. We are born with camels. This is really part of our culture. Tuaregs are been always with camels, but making it as a business is very recent. I mean, last two years. Now it becomes like a fashion. Everybody is after camel milk. We cannot even uh, supply the need on the market. But uh, I mean, people know what they're drinking because they said it has so much benefits. What percentage of the market do you, are you now able to supply? We cannot even supply 10% of the market need. It's not enough. We're trying to bring more camels, trying to make more milk, but it's really not enough. Everybody wants camel milk. So how, how much quantity do you produce in a day? 1,500 liters per day, in, from uh, evening milking and morning milking. And uh, if you convert that to money, how much money do you make? In about dollars? about uh, $3,000 a day. $3,000? 3, and a day. you milk every single day? Every so single day. So you multiply $3,000 and uh, start it one to get the amount of money you make in a month. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. That's why we want to make it more camels, more milk. More, more business, of course. What kind of products do you get out of this camel? I mean, you can only get milk and meat from camels. It doesn't have enough fat in camel milk. So you can only drink it 
I mean, that's the only thing you can do with camel milk. Just drink, but you cannot cheese or any other products yeah. like yogurts. No, yeah. it doesn't work at all. I can't see yeah. the milk coming off. It just come off. Camel milk is 0.5% of the global milk production, but more than 90% of the global camel milk is produced in Africa. This alone amounts for 8% of milk production on the continent, according to a report by Dairy Reporter. So we export the camels like to Libya, to Algeria, to other countries for meat, like Nigeria. We supply them with camels, but not milk. How much does one camel cost? A camel's, camel's price is different. It's always different from the camels. As you can see the camels, yeah. look at this one, how different it is from like from the this one. one. Yeah. You what? see it, the sh it's the healthy, shape. it's big, it's fat. It's all these things that makes the prices different, but it's say in a range of seven hundred dollars to one color is seven hundred dollars minimum. I mean, uh, really, uh, camel fur. Yeah. And the big one? The big one can go up to two thousand dollars. One camel. One camel. Yeah. I seem to have learned more about camels in that single report than I did in my whole life. Now, thirteen-year-old Zamir is practicing spinning. That's doing stunts with race cars. He wants to become the best spinner in South Africa. Car spinning is a popular motorsport in the country. It involves running in circles with squeaky tires and maneuvering round obstacles. Here's Zamir's story. I do car spinning because I, I like the adrenaline. It's, it's a nice feeling. You, you don't want to stop. Spinning cars, you, you don't actually need a license. I grew up in a family with cars. Like my grandfather was a mechanic, my father was a mechanic. So I grew up loving the sport. He like jumps on the bonnet, opens the doors. I want to learn like running over a car, standing on the roof. Most of them my dad does. I'm not afraid uh, because I've taught him what he knows. So at the end of the day, if he bumps me, it's my own fault. I trust him. He's my son. Some crazy stuff. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sport. Ever tried spinning before? No, but I think you have, haven't you? We used to call them donuts. You know, <laughs> oh, really? Fun, yeah. Now, count me out. I'll never do it. <laughs> We begin in basketball and to the 2019 Women's Afro Basket taking place in Dakar, Senegal. Nigeria, who are the reigning champions earlier today, secured a place in the semifinals after beating the Democratic Republic of Congo 79-46 to as Zine Kalu on 17 points in that game. Mozambique also secured a spot in the semifinals by beating Egypt 80-66. to Tamara Seda with 17 points and 13 rebounds. Mali and Cote d'Ivoire currently playing, and later on the host Senegal will face Angola. And on Saturday, Arsenal will face Burnley at home in the English Premier League. And at their press conference today, their head coach Unai Emery says that he will decide in training tomorrow if Nicolas Pepe, the Ivory Coast international, will start for the game on Saturday. Emery says that the most expensive African player is improving and understanding their style of play. Pepe is signing with us, is improving with us, is knowing us, our idea, our style, is leader by leader, understand better with the teammates, and physically also getting better. And he's more close to help us at the beginning or uh, after uh, giving impact for us uh, during the match. And still in football, a recall for Leicester City striker Kelechi Ehenacho for Niger's friendly next month against Ukraine. Coach Gernot Rohr had left out Ehenacho of the final squad for the Africa Cup of Nations in Egypt this summer. And fit again, Benfica defender Tyrone Ebwehi has been included after a year out with a cruciate ligament injury. Rohr has gone with the majority of the squad that finished third in the Nations Cup last month. The Nigerian FA says the game game will serve as a build-up to the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations qualifying, which starts in November. 
And Ghana midfielder Emmanuel Ajemang Badu is in hospital with blood clots in his lungs. His Serie A club Hellas Verona, where he is on loan from Udinese, said he was admitted on Wednesday evening after being diagnosed with pulmonary microembolism. But he posted on his social media today that he was doing much better. The 28-year-old is expected to remain in hospital for a few days for further observation. Now, Sadio Mane has a lot to be smiling about after Liverpool have their first silverware of the season. After beating Chelsea to win the Super Cup, the score level after 90 minutes with the Senegal star getting on the score sheet twice. The match went to penalties with Mohamed Salah scoring what proved to be the winning spot kick, making it 5-4. Liverpool lifting the trophy for the fourth time in their history. But for Senegal star Mane, the win may not have been their best performance. I think, uh, yeah, it was really important for us to, to win this trophy because uh, the world is here to win. So, yeah, we know that it wasn't our best game, but, uh, yeah, it's normal. It's part of football. And I think sometimes you don't need to play 100% or to play, um, to be physically 100% to win trophies. So, I think, uh, yeah, mentally we was here and uh, we give everything until the end i think uh, yeah we deserve to win tonight and we are really proud and very happy that's sadio mana there and that's all the sport back to you peter hey thanks mimi thank you very much now in a first for african fashion global retailer h&m has partnered with a south african designer to bring her unique collection to selected stores around the world palisa mokubong is the founder of the manso label that celebrates the vibrancy of African women. Afrocentric dresses, wraps and accessories have now gone on sale. We spoke to Palesa at the preview launch in Johannesburg. So here we have the kimono. It's made in the print that is influenced by the Basuta blanket. And then we've got my favorite sweater, as you can see. I'm a sweater girl. It means so much to me, but I think it also means a lot to South Africans and the continent in, in general to have a first African in retail and a woman and black. Uh, in South Africa particularly because we don't have a, a female role model in fashion. I make clothes for women, so I understand what how they feel in my clothes. We've got the fun and very fun lady dress um, and a sarong which we've used as a head wrap. I mean this moment is, is historic uh, because I'm sure a lot of young women are looking at me now and thinking okay okay I'm on the right track I can do this and the way I am the way I look I don't need to change anything about myself I you know I can be strong I can speak my mind I can be true to myself. The fact that it took an international brand to come and notice me and put me on a pedestal, it really maybe does say something about you know where we are um, in South Africa, where the fashion industry is in South Africa. But at the same time, it really you know it really doesn't matter. Maybe I needed to be on a stage this big for the world to notice, and um, it's really an amazing. And I hope it's a trend you know that that H and M has started. So it really is a story about an, an African woman and, and, and the African aesthetic and, and, um, and um, I guess just taking ownership of our story and, and creating the prints and the graphics, you know, and to, to go with that. Now when, when you think of Africa, you're going to have an image in mind, you're going to have a dance move in mind, you know, you're going to have an energy in mind. I'm just so grateful for my label with a meaning of, of black is beautiful, a, a beautiful black woman. To be the center, to be at the center of the stage, I'm grateful for, for the world to, to just celebrate that. And a lot of my colleagues feverishly clicking on their keyboards today to try and get their hands on some of those clothes. Mimi's run off to the shop, by the way. As for me, I'm not sure they will have a sarong in my size. That's it on Focus on Africa from me, Peter Okwote, and the rest of the team. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.